Hello. In this short video, I'm going to expand upon the ideas I explained in my previous video, an 8th grader's physics theory. Here, I'm going to explain how the problem of a particle in a potential can be solved using my mathematical construct. <clears throat> First, let's start with a brief description of QCI theory, the theory that I have developed and overviewed in my previous video, an 8th grader's physics theory. QCI theory is based upon the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, which states that a particle goes along all possible paths whenever it travels between two different locations. That's the basic idea behind the path integral formulation of quantum mechanics, and as I explained in my previous video, you can calculate a sum of contributions over all possible paths to calculate the probability amplitude that a particle will arrive at a particular location. Now, if you're a physicist, and if you studied quantum field theory or things of that nature, then you should be familiar with this mathematical construct. It's very basic to those uh, fields of physics. Now, the key idea here is that Feynman, in his classic textbook, divided a time interval suppose our time interval is big T, into a number of different slices, time slices, so to speak. And he calculated a multiple integral for each such collection of time slices. And as you allow the number of time slices to approach infinity, then these multiple integrals will approach your total contributions from all possible paths. Now, this was well described in my previous video. If you are not familiar with this time-slicing definition of path integration, I suggest that you go look at that uh, video on Eighth Grade's Physics Theory, and it, there will be a good explanation there. Now, the sum of all contributions from all possible paths is given by the limit as n approaches infinity of a multiple integral of the contribution, which is e to the i over h bar s, with s the action, over dx sub 1 through dx sub n minus 1. x sub 1 through x sub n minus 1 are all the positions along our discrete or time-sliced path, skeletonized path, so to speak, and this is our contribution formula. And we're integrating over all possible contributions, and then we're letting the number of time slices approach infinity. As I explained in my previous video, my basic idea here is to let n be a complex number, because there are many ways in which a complex number may approach infinity, Then this will lead to multiple different propagators. What does that mean? It means multiple different laws of motion, because what a propagator does is give you a law of motion that describes how particles behave. Multiple laws of motion might well mean multiple universes, different realms governed by different laws of physics, where particles behave according to these different propagators. Now, <clears throat> S, this is the key idea, is given by the integral of the Lagrangian over time. The Lagrangian for these discrete paths Feynman defines as m halves delta x over epsilon squared minus v. v is the potential. Delta x is the difference in x values from xj to xj plus 1, say, and epsilon describes the size of our time slices. The size of our time slices. Now, that's the key idea. What is the size of a complex number given by? That's right, the absolute value or magnitude. And so if we want to extend these to a complex number of time slices, then epsilon should be defined as the absolute value of t over z, where z is the total number of time slices and t is the total time interval. That's because epsilon describes the relative sizes of each of the time slices. And delta x, of course, describes the difference between xj plus 1 and xj, say. So it's the difference in x values between two adjacent uh, positions in this discrete path, and epsilon is the size of the time slices. Using this, I described in my previous video that for a free particle, your result is a standard free particle propagator to a complex number z, where z 
is a complex number on the unit circle. So, just to review here, we extended Feynman's formulas to a complex number of time slices. And what we got was a free particle propagator, but now with a complex exponent. This is all described in my paper. You can find my paper on qciphysics.com. Now, what I'm going to do here is solve the problem of a particle and a potential. Uh, you can find the full description on my website. What I'm going to do here is just briefly outline how you do this. You take, uh, this is in fact the same process as described in Feynman's book. You take e to the i over h bar s. You divide s up into the free particle action and the action that's due to the potential. And then you take the action that's due to the potential and what you do is you find a Taylor series for that component of the exponent and you use that Taylor series to derive a perturbation formula so that you can actually find approximations for what the particle and the potential should do and this is what you get is a description of a particle scattering it off the potential in various ways. This is all described in Feynman's book but essentially the result is an infinite series um, by taking more terms in the series, you can more closely approximate how a particle behaves in the in a potential, or or rather the uh, propagator of a particle in a potential. But if we use our generalization and apply the same exact process, what we get is interesting. In this case, in a particle in potential, it isn't simply a complex power of the standard propagator. It's much more complicated than that. In fact, this is amazing. What we get when we carry out this generalization is the same as if we would just use a natural integer number of time slices, but instead use an action defined by z times m halves x prime squared minus v over z dt. And so essentially what that means is that this process is equivalent, equivalent that is, to simply using an integer number of time slices like what is standard, but instead using this action. This action given by a z in front of the standard action and also a 1 over z in front of the potential. Now, the Euclidean action is similar to this. The Euclidean action occurs when you take path integrals over imaginary time, except for the potential. You have plus v instead of minus v over i for the Euclidean action. And so, the results here are different than that of quantum mechanics in imaginary or complex time. And the interpretation is different too. Instead of letting the total time interval be complex, we're dividing it into a complex number of time slices. And again, we interpret these different propagators as applying to different universes. Uh, there's not any way I have foreseen yet to actually experimentally confirm this idea. It's a tentative suggestion at best but it's possible that someone, when analyzing this theory, will somehow come up with some way to falsify it sometime in the future. So, that's basically what, we're, what our goal is here, to, to experimentally confirm it. That there are these different universes with these, these different propagators that apply to them. And you can derive a Schrodinger equation from these propagators, minus h bar squared over 2m times del squared psi plus v z psi equals i h bar z d psi d t where z is now a complex number on the unit circle so these different Schrodinger equations would apply to these different universes it's an interesting idea and you might say well conservation of probability doesn't apply here that's strange it's not unitary so what can that mean if conservation of probability doesn't apply well if you have say a hundred particles and they um, are in an experimental apparatus and they have, say, a 30% chance of appearing over all space. In quantum mechanics, since wave functions are normalized, there's a 100% probability of finding the particle somewhere, but if there's, say, a 30% chance of finding the particle somewhere after a certain time, then you will find about 30 particles at the end of the experiment. Some of them would disappear from space itself. That's pretty bizarre, but that's not physically meaningless. Again, you can find all this information on my website, uh www.qciphysics.com and you find a lot of information in my previous video which talked about the free particle propagator and 8th graders 
physics theory. Because I am, in fact, in high school now, but I'm doing this level of abstract mathematics, which is pretty unusual. Uh, well, goodbye. Check out my website. I hope you think this is an interesting idea.